The silence is broken by somebody crying Trying to be heard, never a word Always the attitude, sort out your own Always alone, wishing for something The world is denying Out in the wilderness somebody's crying Somebody wishing for something to happen Wishing to tell, wishing to help Someone was listening, someone who cared Never despair, someone to lean on And someone to trust Who needs your assistance and finds your disgust Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayanna Young. Today we are speaking with Dr. Shearer, who is the co-founder and CEO of Full Circle Biochar. Prior to launching Full Circle Biochar, Dr. Shearer was chief scientist at California Environmental Associates and principal environmental scientist at AeroVironment, Inc., where he worked in the next generation transportation, energy, carbon mitigation, and information technology space. In addition to his private sector activities, Dr. Scherer has directed groundbreaking work in both public policy and philanthropic investment for climate change mitigation. Dr. Scherer sits on several nonprofit and educational boards, including Sky Truth and Black Rock Labs. He has a PhD and an MS in environmental microbiology from the University of California and a BS in biology from the University of Oregon. Well, I just want to start off by really feeling into that more and more people are awakening to the realities of climate change and the Anthropocene. And I really feel this active burning in communities to do something, to restore, renew, or to look for solutions. And I really feel like biochar is one of them. I remember when I first learned of biochar, I basically wanted to convert all of my wood heating and cooking into a biochar machine. Not to mention that biochar is so beneficial in forest restoration and biochar cookstoves for communities in rural Africa and South America. So I'd love to just jump right into your work that you're doing at Full Circle Biochar. And if you could start us off by telling us the basics about biochar. What is it? How is it created? And what is the climate mitigating potential for its application? Biochar is simply charcoal that's purpose made not to burn for heat or cooking, but to be used for agriculture. Biochar is made by heating up biomass or really anything that has a, a sugar, a carbon source, and heating it up in the absence of oxygen. When we burn wood in a fireplace, we uh, depend on oxygen to oxidize that wood to create heat. But there's a small part of that process that creates charcoal that has very low oxygen concentrations. Thus, the charcoal is produced. The way you produce biochar is you put biomass, whether it's chicken litter, urban tree waste, the waste streams of palm oil production, for example, you put that material inside of a chamber and you heat it up without oxygen. You bake it, you don't burn it. And the net result is a material that's almost 98% carbon. The value of biochar in the context of climate change is actually twofold. The first is that we now recognize that carbon mitigation, i.e. stopping new emissions and climate adaptation, adapting to a changing climate, will not be enough for us to be able to withstand the impacts of climate change. We also need to think about carbon drawdown, which basically means drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and doing something with that. Whether you are using it to make green plastics, to make green fuels, or in our case, making biochar. So we're using plants to draw down the carbon dioxide and converting that biomass into charcoal, which if you make it the right way, it's a very long half-life. I mean, once you make charcoal the right way, 
it's around for thousands of years. And so biochar is part of this whole new wave of carbon drawdown technologies where we are literally drawing down the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, stabilizing it in the form of charcoal and mixing it into soils. The reason this is important because the half-life of carbon dioxide is very long. It literally takes thousands of years for the carbon dioxide that's now up in the atmosphere to be fully removed. Clearly, we don't have a thousand years to wait, so we really need to do something, and, and, and one of them is to dry down carbon. The other thing that biochar does in the context of climate change is it builds in resilience into agricultural systems. Because we're going to see wide swings of weather, whether it's water, heat, cold in on the planet, we need to build in the capacity to withstand those wide extremes into ag systems. It's called resilience. Plants and soil systems have to create a essentially a buffer that allows us to deal with these extremes while at the same time grow food for the planet. And also um, the benefits to the soil, like water retention and uh, areas for fungi and bacteria to live. Would you mind speaking a bit of the benefits in this agricultural context? So biochar is a remarkable material. This is not something new. If you think about fires on the planet, Fires are a very, while very destructive in terms of their effect on humanity, fire is built into natural ecosystems. It's a natural process that literally creates charcoal, creates biochar that's used to regenerate soils. For a variety of reasons, we can't rely on natural fires to regenerate soils anymore for all the reasons we understand. So what biochar is, it's essentially we're biomimicking fire that's found in nature. And once you actually produce this charcoal, if, again, you produce it the right way, all biochars are not the same. Some biochars can be made that are actually toxic to plants, while other biochars are incredibly effective at regenerating soils. Um, in the near term, what biochar does is it provides a way to optimize the use of water and plant nutrients in egg systems. The surface of biochar is very interesting. It's chemically active to the extent that it can bind plant nutrients, whether it's the macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or many of the micronutrients, or it can also retain water. In, so, in many ways, it can be seen as an on-demand system for plant nutrients and water for plants. And it allows these materials, whether it's plant nutrients or water, to be retained, not run off the field into adjacent waterways, but actually be retained in the soil itself. The other thing that biochar does is it provides habitat for microorganisms. And it's very, very effective at doing this. There's been many studies that compare soils with and without biochar, and you see orders of magnitude more microbiology in biochar soils than soils that don't have charcoal or, or biochar. And, and we know that soil plant systems, it's really a full circle to the extent that it relies on both microbiology and inorganic nutrients to deliver nutrients to plants and plants in return will exude sugar molecules. They're called exudates that will feed the microbiology communities that are embedded in biochar. So there's a very beautiful symbiotic relationship between plants feeding microbiology and microbiology mobilizing the nutrients that are bound up in biochar and then delivering them back to plants themselves. You know, there's a revolution going on right now in agriculture called precision ag, where we are now able to measure using remote sensing technology, the concentration of plant nutrients and water and carbon in every square meter on a field. Business as usual, we have just essentially put the same concentration of nitrogen across a whole acre. But we know that a field is very heterogeneous in terms of its chemical and physical properties. And one meter in a field may be really quite different than another meter in the field in terms of its ability to both retain water and retain plant nutrients. So we can bundle this data of what's on every square meter on a field with the ability to deliver using robotics and the Internet of Things exactly what's required on that every square meter. So yes, we then we become much more efficient in terms of how we use nitrogen and phosphorus. You know, people forget that the, one of the other peak issues we care about is peak phosphorus. 
where you know, phosphorus is one of the big three elements we need for agriculture. And the value chain of phosphorus is very fragile because something like 95% of the world's phosphorus comes from just two countries, Western Sahara and Morocco. And that makes it very fragile. And we waste most of the other phosphorus that's frankly emitted from our feces and from all the other animals. We just let it go down the drain and we pollute waterways. So by some estimates, we only have 50 to 60 years left of phosphorus in those two dominant countries. But without phosphorus, it's not going to happen in terms of ag. So we need to close those loops. We need to close those broken nitrogen and phosphorus cycles and begin to extract not so much extract, but maintain those nutrient flows back into egg systems. And so back to biochar, the reason that animal manures are so interesting as a form of biochar production is because, number one, there's a lot of animal manures out there. But number two, they're high in nitrogen and phosphorus. And it just so happens that if you make biochar the right way, you can retain those phosphorus and nitrogen molecules in the biochar itself. So not only are you creating a carbon material, but you're really playing a substitute product for fertilizer. And that's very exciting. And frankly, Big Ag is taking notice of this because they recognize now that what they've been doing over the last 150, 200 years has been destroying topsoil. We can't keep on doing it business as usual. And so recognition that soil health must be part of a business's focus is really going to allow us then to recapture and to deploy biochar and biochar with nutrients into big ag because number one, it's a brand new market around regenerative ag as opposed to extraction ag. But number two, it's really helping rebuild soils. It's helping recognize that, that we can't keep on letting phosphorus and nitrogen wash away off soil systems or, or wash away animal feces or human feces. That just makes no sense at all. You've mentioned a few times there's a right way to make biochar and a wrong way. I'm interested in hearing why different methods are beneficial and are not beneficial. And I'm wondering how do the processes you utilize to create biochar differ from the way it forms naturally through vegetation fires or the over 2,500-year-old traditional production methods of the Amazon basin? That's an interesting question. The way you make biochar, as I said, is you heat up biomass in the absence of oxygen. The rate of heating, the amount of heating, the absolute temperature you use, whether it's 450 degrees C or 700 degrees C, and the different rate of heating, the amount of time the biochar is in the kiln itself, will determine whether the resultant biochar that's created is toxic to plants or wildly beneficial to plants. When I say toxic, some kilns, because of the way they are operating and because of the operating conditions, you need to keep in mind that a kiln itself will produce three different types of material. There'll be a solid biochar, there'll be a liquid waste stream, which will be essentially plant tars, and there will be gases. And the liquid tars, if the, since some of these liquid tars and plants are not healthy for plants, if again, the biochar system is not run in the correct way, these tars will recondense back onto the biochar itself and produce a film on the biochar that is toxic to plants. On the other hand, if you have the right heating regimes, if you have the right amount of time in the kiln itself, you will produce a biochar that not only is stable, since keep in mind, um, biochar is a very effective carbon mitigation strategy. And frankly, that's why full circle biochar was initially founded, was to formalize products that stored atmospheric carbon and charcoal that could then be used for agricultural purposes. So how you make the charcoal will determine about how resilient it is, whether the carbon itself, the charcoal itself, has half-lives of 200 years versus 1,000 years. And it also will determine the what's called the cation exchange capacity of the biochar, the, the ability of biochar to retain nutrients. And it will also affect the porosity of the biochar itself. How much water can it retain? And again, this all is determined by the actual recipes that you make the biochar itself. And that's not to suggest that the original ways that the indigenous populations around the planet made biochar wasn't helpful because even bad biochar, if it doesn't have recondensed tars, 
is quote unquote bad is actually useful to plants. But if you really are interested in climate and agriculture production, you want to optimize the storage capacity of charcoal, i.e. how long will it be around? And ideally, we want it to be around for centuries to millennia. And then you can you can affect the pH of the biochar, depending on how you make it, and you can affect the ability of the biochar to retain nutrients and water. And again, that's all in how do you produce the biochar itself. Each feedstock will be different, whether you start with chicken litter, whether you start with urban tree waste, whether you start with some other form of, of carbohydrate. The actual process of turning it into very valuable biochar for the planet will be determined by the process conditions and the feedstock that you start with. You can actually look at it as a platform. There'll be different platforms depending on the feedstock you start with, the process conditions, and eventually the end use markets that you're trying to use the biochar in, whether it's high value crops like vegetables and fruits or whether it's row crops like wheat, et cetera. talk a bit about the markets for biochar because with all of the benefits of the water holding and the nutrient enriching and the carbon drawdown, it seems like if there is a way to get this biochar into industrial agriculture for the time being, we could see major benefits. Um, Even I think about the wine countries of Northern California that take a lot of water to produce crops and to be able to cut down on water and even potentially cut down on um, fertilizers because there is more nutrient uh, power in the soil. What do you see the path to put biochar into large scale agriculture, thousands of acres? Is it policy? Is it private sector? Is it uh, public sector? You know, how has your research directed you to make as big of an impact as possible? The next step for biochar is to formalize biochar into reproducible products. If you're interested in scaling biochar into big ag, you need to produce a product that is replicable. In other words, for every ton of biochar you make, it has the exact same physical and chemical characteristics. That's the first thing you need to do. And that's really what's starting to happen. We founded Full Circle Biochar in 2008. And it's eight years later, and we're finally being able to begin the process of formalizing, standardizing biochars based on our kiln designs. The second thing that needs to happen, and this has frankly been the biggest hurdle, is creating a stable market signal for biochar in big ag. And that stable market signal comes with demonstrating the value of biochar in field settings. We need to keep in mind that big ag is a relatively conservative market sector. And because once you put biochar in the soil, you can't take it out of the soil easily, you need to, the farmers need to be very assured that they can get the benefits that are advertised by the biochar companies themselves. And so there have been a number of trials that have been ongoing over the last four or five years, and they will continue in different ag sectors that demonstrate to farmers that this stuff actually works. And these trials tend to take multiple years because in California, we have perhaps three three harvests per year in vegetables. But farmers who want to see two or three or four years of consistent data before they invest in biochar systems or biochar products. And then finally, if we had a price on carbon, that would be a huge accelerator in terms of using agricultural lands to store carbon. 
And you know, we've been talking about putting a price on carbon for years and years and years and years. And there still doesn't really exist a stable price on carbon. There are a variety of, of carbon markets around the planet, but the markets themselves are still immature. So it's really those three things that will allow us to scale biochar into big ag. Um, a stable price on carbon, a dependable type of biochar that produces the same results over and over again, and very strong field data, that evidence that will convince farmers that, yes, this is something they should be doing. Another place that I'm really interested in uh, scaling up biochar is in reforestation of clear-cut lands, specifically in the temperate rainforest region where I'm working in. Because I'm really, uh, you know, I'm doing this one million redwoods project right now where I'm going into clear cuts and planting redwoods, their understory species, along with their fungal allies. And of course, redwoods sequester the most carbon of any tree in the world. And then I would imagine if we were able to really swale these degraded lands, add biochar, and then replant these forest systems, we'd have this incredibly charged carbon drawdown forest. And and I'm wondering, you know, what are your thoughts on biochar being applicable within different restoration areas and not just big ag? Well, we know that biochar has the ability to accelerate regeneration, whether it's used in sites that are contaminated with heavy metals, because the biochar can then bind the metals, whether it's regenerating spent agricultural lands. It's not quite as simple as, yes, let's put biochar everywhere, because there is some evidence that in temperate forests, the biochar can actually sequester carbon in itself from the soil systems. In other words, there might be a detrimental effect as opposed to beneficial effect. And, and we tend to see this in temperate forests versus tropical forests. But there are just a few data points suggesting this is the case. So I think, I think like anything, there isn't any one solution that solves, solves all the problems. I think we need to be very smart in terms of how we apply biochar in forest settings. So if you think about global agriculture, there's really four big challenges that have to happen over the next few decades. Number one is we need to decouple the destruction of tropical rainforest from the expansion of agricultural lands. And because if you look at where most of the new lands are coming from for ag production around the planet, it's coming from cutting down tropical rainforests. And clearly, for all sorts of reasons, we need to stop doing that. The second thing we need to do is we need to be much more efficient in terms of how we use inputs, whether it's nutrients or water, which means we need to find a way for soils to retain these plant nutrients and water in soil systems themselves and make sure they don't run off. The third thing is, is we need to decrease the yield gap, which is a term which means how much you, you could theoretically grow in an agricultural setting versus what you're growing now. And we need to reduce that yield gap to maximize the amount of food that we produce per acre. And finally, we need to reduce food waste. Something like 40% of the food production that we use never gets to a table. And what that means is that not only are we wasting food, but we're wasting water because roughly 70 to 80 percent of the world's water goes to agriculture. So if we're wasting 40 percent of the food that's grown, that means that 40 percent of all that water we're using is actually going nowhere. It's just being wasted. So, so back to your question, I mean, you know, biochar is ideal in decoupling tropical rainforests from ag expansion because biochar can regenerate land. And as you point out, there are a variety of settings that can be used for regeneration, whether it's in tropical systems or temperate systems. But I think, we, as anything, we just need to be very wise in terms of how we apply this material, making sure that we are not causing more problems and making sure we're solving problems. You bring up such a important and deeply felt point that as humans, we're really creative beings. And I think that so many of the decisions we've made over the past, especially hundred and so years with the industrial revolution, you know, we've made decisions that aren't so thoughtful into the future of how these decisions can actually affect the climate, uh, biodiversity, even other humans. I think also it's easy to get 
really excited with any solutions because there's such a desperation as we are getting closer and closer to immense devastation on this earth. You know, so I see biochar as this incredible technology, but as you've said so eloquently, use it in the best way possible. And along that same vein, you know, we usually shy away from discussing a lot of technology on this podcast. At For the Wild, we really feel that emphasizing technological innovations as leading solutions can disregard the root origins of the climactic and environmental unravelings we're navigating that as long as we continue to innovate, that we'll be able to maintain or even increase our current levels of consumption. But humans have this innate propensity to create, and I'd love to hear about some of the budding technological innovations that excite or worry you the most that are coming out right now. We are in a very unique moment in history where Many of the technologies that have been developing over the last 20, 30 years are coming to fruition. And um, the cost of manufacturing these technologies is falling so fast. It's exponential in terms of the reduction of cost that it's not hard to imagine that over the next 20 to 30 years, and we are going to completely repower the planet from renewables. I mean, right now, renewables are relatively cost competitive with coal, especially wind. And uh, you expect solar, you expect solar in the next five years to be as well, the most inexpensive form of power production on the planet. So it's easy to imagine that, that the market is going to really be a very large driver in terms of the adopting of these regenerative solutions, whether it's, whether it's renewables, whether it's next generation cars that are powered from electricity as opposed to fossil fuels, regenerative agriculture. I think that, that I think we, we can be very excited about the future, but I think it's also important to remember that, you know, technology itself is neutral and it really depends on the person who applies it, whether it's used for good or bad. And so I'm a big believer that we need to be mindful on how we use technology. It's not just enough to innovate. We need to innovate, but also we need to be mindful in terms of how we apply this technology for the planet. And I think that's especially the case when you think about AI and smart, really sensor computer-driven technology, because over the last 10 years, while the cost of goods for renewables has fallen very fast, so is the cost of sensor technology and small chips that are embedded in everything around us. And so, you know, I'm very excited about smart electricity, smart ag, smart cars, because it, we're going to be able to be a lot more efficient in how we use our materials. But at the same time, we know that AI itself is a double-edged sword. And while, yes, it would be very helpful to be able to, to deliver exactly what's required on every square meter on a field based on remote sensing data, based on robotic tractors that can deliver exactly what's required to that one square meter. At the same time, we need to be going with our eyes wide open and recognize that uh, smart technologies can, again, have a dark side to them. In terms of other things that I'm excited about, um, oh gosh, you know, advanced materials, we hear an awful lot about graphene which is a single layer, one, one atom layer material of pure carbon. We, we know that this is a, it's the lightest, strongest material known to man. We know that it has very interesting electrochemical properties. It's not hard to imagine batteries made from graphene. So imagine drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, using that carbon to make batteries that can then be used to store power for electric cars. I'm excited about genomics. I don't remember the exact data, but 20, 30 years ago, it cost a lot of money just to sequence the DNA of one human being. That cost of technology is falling so fast that it's not hard to imagine that by within five, six, seven years, you will go into your doctor's office and have your DNA sequenced and have the DNA sequence of a pathogen, if it's an infected disease, sequenced as well and have a very specific 
health solution based on the genomics and proteomics of you and the agent that is causing problems for you, the health agent. So, you know, we are literally on the cusp of massive change in terms of technology and it's happening really fast. I think generally people don't recognize that all this technology is being developed at an exponential rate, not only in terms of the cost of production, but because these markets are so large, whether it's the health market or the transportation market or the power market, these are multi-billion dollar markets. And whenever there's that much at stake, the most cost-effective solution will be the solution that wins. And the good news is many of the problems we have now based on carbon fuels, based on accidents from cars, based on extraction, agriculture practices are going to be displaced, not because they're the best solution for the planet, but because they're the most cost-effective solutions. But the good news is these cost-effective solutions will also be the best solutions for the planet. It's incredible to think about these technologies becoming more efficient, being able to, like you said, heal these viruses and, and issues in our bodies. But I guess part of me is wondering, where does that really get us as a culture, as a species? Of course, you know, being more efficient can mean burning of less fossil fuels or not burning fossil fuels at all. Um, if we're healthier, then yes, I can absolutely see benefits from that. But, you know, you spoke about how we use these technologies is so important. And I guess I'm just wondering, what would the ripple effect be if we were healthier and more efficient? Do you see that transforming the way that we treat people, treat other species, the way that we relate to the earth in a uh, reciprocal way. I mean, do you think it can really touch how we even got into this mess in the first place? Uh, that's a great question, and I don't think there is an answer to it. As I said earlier in our conversation, being mindful and how we use technologies is so important because we're trying to bend the arc of change towards good. We know that change is rapid and it's happening so fast around us. And there are folks who want to use this technology to do nefarious things. At the same time, there's a whole group of planetary citizens that are interested in bending the arc of change towards good. So I don't think it's enough just to have great technology. We need to be very conscious about how we develop mindfulness in our own lives. And then, of course, we've seen evidence over the last 50 years that the indigenous populations who practice plant medicines are very powerful tools in terms of, of, of creating a worldview that's based on co-creation with nature as opposed to us dominating nature, which has been the, the predominant worldview for the last 100 years. Feet in the soil, in fertile ground I grow. My roots grow strong, cause I'm making this my own. Light my fire in the earth of happiness. Blossoms of rich and woe will soon confess. Well, thank you for shedding light that technology is not the end-all be-all fix to all of our woes. It is a tool. And like you've been saying, it's really how do we use this technology? Are we mindful? Are we using it for the greater good? Or are we using technology to perpetuate disposable cultures or lift up our human exceptionalism and separatism from nature? Technology, like you said, um, isn't charged, I think. And maybe you use another description, but I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it, like money in a way. Money doesn't necessarily have a power in and of itself, but how are we placing our own values on money, on technology? What are we using it for? Even with biochar, are we putting so much pressure that it is the fix that's going to save us all and we can just continue as a culture being 
destructive and disregarding these intricate relationships of nature? Or are we going to use it for a tool for regeneration and reconnection with each other and with the earth? And it's just such an important point to understand the fullness of how to be in relationship with technology. Absolutely. And and it's not just in relationship with technology, but it's in relationship with with each other, with us, you and I, with our kids and with the animals and plants that surround us. You know, I, I believe strongly that, that this notion of we dominate nature and nature has no saying, not only is that misguided, but that's actually not true that we have been co-creating with nature for millennia. The opportunity here is to recognize that worldview and then to establish a set of practices, whether it's food production, whether it's power production, whether it's buildings, a set of practices that regenerative, that you know we're moving away from an extraction worldview where one plus one equals 10 to a worldview of, of co-creation, of regeneration, where one plus one equals 10. And that's certainly possible. We see all the First Nations around the planet. They have tremendous wisdom that they have used for millennia in terms of their relationship with the planet, with other species. You know, they're they're fabulous in terms of their capacity to engender interspecies communication. I think it's fair to say that over the past 50 years since the 60s, when there was the huge revolution that happened on the planet with respect to the youth, that we're now recapturing or repurposing or able to use this information from indigenous populations and apply it to how we relate to the world around us, while at the same time recognizing that we do need to innovate. We do need to have new technologies in terms of how we produce power for the planet because we're killing the planet the way we do it right now, and we just can't keep on doing it anymore. But the good news is there is a whole new set of technologies that are emerging that are cost competitive that are going to allow us to displace the these old extraction technologies with regenerative technologies. Speaking of these exciting technologies and collaborating with community and really being able to use these technologies to connect even more deeply with each other, I wanted to bring up the Black Rock Labs, which you are a a chair on the board of directors for, which is a nonprofit innovation technology incubator to accelerate regenerative solutions and networked technologies at Black Rock City, the Burning Man regional events, and within wider webs throughout the world. And I read an article recently that mentioned that Black Rock Labs would explore the, quote, Internet of Energy which it's like a technology that epitomizes the storage, regeneration, and dispatching of renewable energy where it's needed, as well as machine learning and innovations in habitat, water, and waste. It sounds so fascinating, and I would love if you could elaborate on these efforts and the climate mitigating uh, potential that they do hold. BlackRock Labs emerged out of BlackRock Solar, which was an NGO, one of Bernie Man's two NGOs, that was used to deploy renewable energy systems off playa into disadvantaged communities in Nevada. We founded Black Rock Solar in 2007. And over the last, gosh, almost eight years, we deployed, I think, something like 104 systems, 7.5 megawatts of power. Uh, it was a wild success in terms of championing one of Bernie Man's 10 principles, the gifting economy and the leave no trace economy and applying it to communities that were adjacent to the Bernie Man event in Nevada. But what happened over the last eight years is our business model at Black Rock Solar, the way we were able to gift these installation was that there was a very aggressive rebate program in Nevada for renewable power. And we were able to, if we financed these systems up front, we could get the money back from the state to cover the cost of these systems and then apply that money to the next system that we deployed. But over the last eight years, the rebate structure in Nevada has slowly ratcheted down, as you would expect to happen. The whole point of a rebate system is to equalize the playing field and allow solar energy to compete against cold-fired power plants. Well, as the cost of solar fell, so did the access to rebates. And so we recognized about a year and a half ago, we being the board of BlackRock Solar, that we really needed to repurpose our vision because the way that we were going to deploy renewables didn't exist anymore. At the same time, we made the observation that 
the cost of sensor technology, the cost of computer chips has also fallen exponentially. And all the technology that really drives the Internet of Things, IoT as it's called for short, has also fallen dramatically. So we realized that we could use the Internet of Things technology to allow us to deploy smart renewable energy, smart water systems at Burning Man itself and at the other regional events around the world. So the Internet of Energy really relies on what we call the fog as opposed to the cloud. We know about the cloud in terms of storing energy or storing information around the planet, and a variety of of tech companies have their cloud-based businesses. The fog is really a ground-level system, and it's a very – it's a, it's a system that's short range. So um, imagine the combination of batteries, solar cells, and end users, and imagine a software solution that's powered by sensors and chips that allow you to be very efficient in terms of how you store the electrons produced from the solar panels on batteries itself, then how do you deploy those renewable electrons to the end users, whether it's at a Burning Man event or, frankly, whether it's at a refugee camp on the planet. So BlackRock Labs was founded to use the canvas of innovation that Burning Man represents and use it to test new ideas around smart water or smart power to discover these ideas, to validate them, and then to promote them beyond the boundaries of Burning Man, because we really see Burning Man as one of many examples of events around the world that are championing new ways of thinking around technology, around how we relate to each other, and how we relate to the planet. We're very excited about this. We being the BlackRock Labs board, reconverted the corporation from BlackRock Solar to BlackRock Labs about nine months ago. Now we're in the process of formalizing what we're going to do and really funding our first projects because just like Burning Man has art grants for the event itself in the desert, we are going to have small tech grants that we will uh, regrant out to develop these next generation regenerative ideas, test them at the various regional events around the world, including um, Black Rock City, and then deploy them beyond the boundaries of our community into the planet itself. That is an incredible way to harness the power of events like Burning Man, where there's so much Uh, creativity and people power and energy behind it, uh, human energy, because I think that to see this melding of so many communities coming together and open sourcing and sharing these ideas and really joining together to make this more accessible, exciting, feels like the really the way of the future. And I think we're really trying to champion the notion that there is a great deal of positive action happening around the planet itself. The news media tends to be dominated by negative energy, negative reporting. And I understand that we have to do that kind of reporting for transparency in terms of what's happening on the planet. But at the same time, we oftentimes we fail to report on all the amazing, great things that are happening on the planet itself. You know, if I think about Burning Man, it's really a combination of art and science, and the interface of art and science is wonder. And I think ultimately that's what we're trying to do is create stories around wonder to create excitement around the future of the planet so people don't feel despair, but they actually want to participate in these new technologies, not based on fear, but based on, dare I say, love. I feel very resonant with that wonder and that love. And honestly, that's what keeps me going with these reforestation projects. That's what wakes me up and pushes me to learn more and to listen more and to observe and just to show up day in, day out in these the midst of these catastrophes that are happening is just the sheer magnitude of how incredible this earth is, the wonder that comes out of that and really the magic It's interesting, we've been talking about a lot of these technologies that are seemingly, let's say, safe in a way, or, you know, they, of course, probably have their dangerous sides to them. But there's other forms of technology that are coming out, which is geoengineering. And I must say that geoengineering and 
techno fixes being proposed make me a little uneasy. You know, for instance, cloud seeding, which alters the size of ice crystals into serious clouds to restrict the amount of infrared radiation they readmit, or a stratospheric aerosol injection, which would spray reflective particles into the atmosphere, or uh, engineered weathering, where some of the ocean's carbonic acid is replaced with hydrochloric acid in order to accelerate underwater storage of CO2. So, you know, I really question if many of these proposed innovations, still in theoretical phases, many of them, and uh, with potentially grievous ecological and atmospheric consequences, are worth all of the effort and billions of dollars. I'm wondering, is there not a more righteous path to focus on carbon drawdown, like some of the stuff we've been talking about in our own, maybe even local living landscapes? Well, it's an interesting point. And if you think about the interface of humanity with the planet, we've been terraforming the planet for 5,000 years to the extent that we have been modifying the surface of the planet for agriculture. We've been modifying the surface of the, of the planet by harvesting trees for habitats. So I think we should recognize right up front that we have been doing this for a long time. Granted, it has been geoengineering light, just like, I mean, I, I think of biochar as a geoengineering light solution compared to sulfate aerosols in the stratosphere. On the other hand, as a scientist, I think it would be prudent for us not to put our head in the sands around these technologies, but to at least understand the risks of them, both the positive and negative risks, because we could find ourselves in a box you know, hypothetically in 50 years, where we know that, for example, the rate of glacier melt is much faster than we thought it was going to be. And we, we find ourselves where the planet and the climate is changing so fast that we aren't able to mitigate the effect. We aren't able to adapt, but we really find ourselves in a very precarious position. It would make sense to me to at least understand these technologies, don't pretend like they don't exist, but recognize that, yes, this is one of many things we might have to do and to do the initial testing and the initial risk analysis so we understand the costs and benefits of any solution, whether it's putting a giant mirror in space to reflect um, incoming radiation back into space whether it's other forms of atmospheric modification. Again, I'm not, I'm not advocating these technologies, but what I'm advocating is an approach to what the potential risks are into the future around a changing climate and what the solutions might be. Now, with respect to local solutions, clearly not putting uh, sulfates in the aerosol is not a local solution. That's a global solution. And so there are technologies that we can use, like biochar, which is frankly a very local solution. Because if you're interested in the climate benefits of biochar, what that really means is you can't really be, you have to draw a circle that has a radius of about 50 miles or 75 miles from where you make the biochar itself. If you start trucking biomass hundreds of miles away, you start to lose the carbon benefit because of transportation carbon emissions. And so you need to be really smart in how you do this. And it's clear that regenerative ag, for example, is a regional and local solution. Biochar is a, is a regional local solution. Renewables is a regional local solution under the heading of distributed generation. That it doesn't really make sense for many reasons to build gigantic, huge solar farms in the middle of the desert and then transport the power unless you revision in terms of how the, the transmission system works. And so I think there's a balance there between local solutions, think global, act globally, at the same time, making sure that we are really smart in terms of how we evaluate these quote unquote emergency solutions that will perhaps help us get out of the climate disaster that we might face in 50 to 100 years. Wow, I never looked at it that way with the geoengineering, these global solutions, that we should try to understand them in case of 50 years from now being in a place where we are kind of at the end of our plank, so to speak. Because when I've been reading about these stratospheric aerosol injections, 
uh, proposed as a climate solution by Harvard physicists. I, I was reading that earlier this year and you know, saying it could result in reduction of the ozone layer, decreased rainfall, heightened risk of exposure to UV radiation, increased ocean acidification. It sounds like a prescription, <laughs> a commercial for prescription pills or something. You know, uh, here's all these horrendous side effects. And so I, I'm trying to take in these side effects and then listening to what you said about, well, if we're at a place 50 years from now where the ice has all melted and we're basically in this end game scenario and we haven't come up with any other solutions or tested anything at that time you know what are we left with and it's a really interesting existential question about mortality even what are we willing to do to keep humanity alive it's a very deep question you know what are we willing to do what are we what kind of side effects are we willing to put on ourselves, our own health, on the health of the planet, of all the other species to make sure that we survive. And then it's like survive through what? And survive in what type of condition? You know, what are we willing to risk to stay alive and at what cost? And what would the other end even look like? Would that even be a world that is worth I mean, it's hard to say worth living in because it's hard to even understand what that would be like. But I guess these are just some of the thoughts that are coming up for me. Yeah, you know, it's a really good question. And I don't frankly have an answer. You know, one man's ceiling is another man's floor, literally. What one person might find to be attractive, the other person might be horrified by. But I do know that we need degrees of freedom. We need to keep our options open. And I fear that if the backlash of bioengineering extends itself to where we aren't prohibited to do any of this stuff, I think that's probably a mistake because we need to understand how the technology works. We need to understand what the risks and benefits are. And keep in mind, climate change is a global, is a global phenomena. Carbon dioxide is the same concentration anywhere on the planet that you measure. And so, frankly, so is stratospheric uh, sulfate release into the uh, atmosphere. Should one country be able to do this without having the oversight of another country? There's active discussion going on right now in the geoengineering world about even if we were going to do some trial experiments around David Keith's idea out of Harvard around the stratospheric um, sulfate idea, you know, how are we going to manage this? And, and I suspect that's why organizations like the UN are so important because climate change is a global existential threat. Even though there are some things we can do locally to help mitigate climate change, like reduce local ozone levels, which really comes from reducing transportation emissions, reducing black carbon emissions, which come from burning, for example, animal manures for power. There's all sorts of things that we can do locally that will have a short-term effect for climate change, but the big one is carbon dioxide. And that's a multi-generational um, century level problem that we have to solve. And thus, my advocating to make sure that we vet all these technologies with a very strong focus on cost benefit and making sure that we use the precautionary principle in terms of how we do this. We need to prove to ourselves that this is going to hurt us as opposed to focusing on just the benefits themselves. Just using science, using uh, transparency, and using you know, a global dialogue in terms of, of how we might want to pursue these technologies. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, I win. If you wait for that tenth time, it's like waiting for God to send. I don't know many men that can stop the weather with the words that they jot together. I'll be hot forever. Soul of a heat, flow of a beast. So unique from my teeth to the sole of my feet. When I speak, I put a hole in the beat. It's true that displacing indigenous populations to grow monoculture tree farms to produce biochar, it's not a very good idea. And I suspect that there are people who want to do that. At the other hand, you know, there are folks who recognize that there are waste streams of biomass that are now being used inefficiently that can be used to produce biochar to regenerate the planet. So it's like anything. It's really complicated out there. <laughs> and, and thus the need to be mindful. That's, I mean, if, if anything, that would be the one message I would, I would want to communicate to your audience is 
be mindful, understand your position in the universe on a planet, understand your relationship with other people, understand, you know, how you relate to the environment and, and make decisions based on mindfulness, based on an integrative approach where we are all one, as opposed to making selfish unilateral decisions that may benefit you or your corporation, but will not benefit the rest of the planet. There is a way to revision how how we relate to women and children and animals that doesn't take away about who we are, but adds to it in exponential way. And we can talk all day long, but it's really about execution at this point. It's about executing around clean energy, uh, regenerative agriculture. And you know, once we show that this stuff is real, then I think people will be a lot more willing to to get involved. Um, you know, the other thing that we didn't talk about is my work with Sky Truth, which is um, NGO based out of DC that uses earth observation data, satellite imagery to solve problems on the planet. And um, a great example of this is we were the nonprofit that blew the whistle on BP during the big spill in 2010 by tasking satellites, taking a picture of the slick and saying to BP, you guys, this is much bigger than you're saying it is. And it's really because of the democratization of this space data that we're able to start to solve global problems. Our latest win is a platform called Global Fishing Watch, which is a smartphone-based app powered by Google Earth Engine that allows us to track almost real-time every fishing vessel on the planet from space. And this is so disruptive because for the first time, we can look at the dark oceans and begin to understand who is raping the seas where we can't see, and then begin to enforce existing regulations around fishing. And also, we can validate those fishing vessels that are doing sustainable fishing practices and allow them to sell their fish into sustainable fish markets. And, and it's really this vast democratization of information, whether it's through the internet, whether it's through Earth observation data, that's allowing us to do things that we could never do before. And it's frankly only in the last two years that we're able to monitor all these ships because of the advent of a, a, new, a new form factor for satellites. They're called CubeSats. And instead of being enormous, they're the size of a bread box. Instead of costing three, four, five hundred million dollars to design, manufacture, and launch, they cost fifteen thousand dollars to do that. And therefore, um, there's two or three really great. Uh, startups, one of them is called Planet, that are launching 70, 80, 90 satellites at a time. And within six months, they're going to be full coverage of the whole planet 24-7. And I understand that this is a double-edged sword to the extent that, hmm, I don't know if I want someone to be watching me all the time 24-7. But the other hand, that means we can begin to solve the global commons problem around forestry, around fisheries, around agriculture, because we can see it. You know, our motto at, at SkyTruth is that we, if you can see it, you can change it. And really the same thing applies to everything we've been talking about, Ayana, where if people can see that regenerative agriculture not only makes money, but makes a lot of sense, they're going to do it. It's just in the absence of demonstration and the absence of data, people begin to question what we're saying is true and they call it fake news. The fact of the matter is, this is not only is it real, but it's happening today, and it's going to happen a lot faster over the next five to ten years. So you're actually able to, in a sense, be a watchdog for the oceans, for you know, deep in the Amazon where they might be doing illegal logging and things of that nature. You can actually make sure that uh, this stuff is being witnessed so that it can be stopped. Exactly, exactly, and that's really only been possible in the last two or three years. I mean, yes, NASA had, and the defense industry had satellites, but we couldn't access that data. We couldn't access that imagery. And it's really only, as I said, in the last two or three, four years that this imagery has become available to almost everyone. We just happen to be a group that's able to write code and team up with Google 
to allow it to be broadcast on a smartphone that lets you to choose what part of the ocean you want to monitor almost real time. And then we have a little dashboard that allows you to categorize the kind of fishing vessel that's there, the kind of fishing they're doing, where are they fishing, all the data points that matter in terms of whether it's illegal fishing or legal fishing. Very exciting. It really is. Drifting on the wind Through the mountains like a river Thank you for listening to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayanna Young. The music you heard today was Stephen Morgan with Crossing Over, Samuela Akert, Garden of Dreams, and Capital A, Nod Your Head. I'd like to thank our incredible podcast team, our producers, March Young and Andrew Storrs, Research Director, Madison Mogulski, Media Director, Molly Lebo. Our podcast relies on your donations. So please head over to forthewild.world and make a contribution to help us continue keeping the show going. And while you're there, check out our new podcast study guides and let us know what you think. Thank you and until next time. Through the mountains like a river.